If you have um, Bibles with you and uh, they're open at Jeremiah chapter 6, we'll be following through that tonight. Uh, like last week, I'll uh, um, basically read uh, sections of it as we, uh, as we move through the chapter. Uh, and tonight we're going to consider the, well, basically the uh, concluding or a gathering portion of uh, what we've seen in the uh, opening chapters of Jeremiah which has been uh, uh, God uh, well, laying out his um, issue uh, with the, the people of, of Judah. Uh, you might be aware of the process of uh, refining or assaying. It's a process by which a, a precious uh, mineral or metal is uh, uh, heated and uh, what is impure is burnt away way uh, and what is uh, remaining in uh, chapter verse 27 of, of chapter 6 we see that uh, Jeremiah is basically uh, given a job of being a, a tester of metals uh, among uh, God's people that you may know and test their ways and again this is another pattern of God demonstrating that what befalls the people who are uh, supposed to be his people yet live in uh, complacent uh, rebellion against him uh, that, that what's going to befall them is, is completely justified and that uh, it's their character uh, that is at fault uh, and there's nothing uh, in God's character except uh, consistency and love. Uh, so as we uh, uh, consider this, uh, we're going to think about the impurities that deserve judgment as they're unfolded uh, through chapter 6. Um, uh, verse 1 opens up uh, flee for safety O people of Benjamin from the midst of Jerusalem uh, blow the trumpet in Tekoa and raise a signal on uh, Beth Hakarim for disaster looms out of the north uh, and great destruction uh, the lovely and delicate bread, delicately bred I will destroy the daughter of Zion uh, shepherds with their flocks shall come against her they shall pitch their tents around her they shall pasture each in his place prepare war against her arise and let us attack at noon woe to us for the day declines for the shadows of evening lengthen arise and let us attack by night and destroy her palaces we've already seen uh, uh, in prior chapters this indication of a, a destroyer who will come down from the north and in that we've uh, uh, also uh, seen unfold around us that the uh, people of Judah and Israel before them had sought to find their security uh, in the nations around them uh, uh, but instead of finding security, those nations uh, uh, were the ones who were going to come and assail them and uh, devour them and attack them. And so there's this uh, warning uh, for the people of Jerusalem uh, in the area of um, Jude, the tribe of Judah and Benjamin, uh, that these people were not to find any sense of security from their address. Uh, uh, we live in Mount Gambia and uh, we tend to think that it's a pretty nice part of the world that we're somewhat drowned outproofed here uh, and uh, uh, immune to uh, uh, a lot of the affliction uh, that besets primary producers and because of that the uh, uh, life living in a, in a rural or provincial area uh, and yet uh, um, that sense that we might uh, term in as a sense of complacency uh, was in Jerusalem because uh, simply they believed that because uh, God's temple was there and because of the promises that God had given about being in their midst uh, that they were immune uh, and yet um, it, it verse 2 uh, points out and says that uh, uh, the lovely and delicately bred I will destroy the daughter of Zion now there's a, uh, it's a, apparently a very difficult verse to translate and yet the, uh, uh, the sense of it is that there will be this ugly outcome for even this um, uh, what is meant to be this beautiful place the place of God's own heart uh, and uh, uh, it's likened to being a, a beautiful woman uh, who undergoes um, uh, terrible treatment uh, again in the news uh, through the week in Melbourne we've seen uh, uh, another uh, young woman uh, suffer um, uh, an outrageous attack uh, for no reason whatsoever uh, and uh, here the idea is given of Jerusalem which thinks of itself as being privileged and beyond that sort of thing uh, that it is going to suffer and endure uh, what will be uh, to its detriment and to its end and uh, 
the idea of uh, what had been cast as being benign uh, is actually a great threat. The shepherds with their flocks shall come against her. They shall pitch their tents around her. Uh, they shall pasture each in her place. Uh, the people had uh, sought to find their security in these other nations and in finding their security in them, they thought that they meant no threat to them. Uh, but the, the opposite was actually the case. Uh, and what is usually a sense of respite and this idea of pleasant uh, uh, sheep and, and their shepherds being uh, the, the most harmless are actually the, uh, going to be arrayed against them, uh, prepare war against her. And there's this um, sense of dialogue that unfolds in verses 4 and uh, and five uh, of their attack and, and of the nature of it and that they will uh, um, arise let us attack at noon uh, and even in, in the sense of what would ordinarily be a time when the attack would uh, let up uh, a woe to us for the day declines and the shadows of evening lengthen uh, that the, the cry will go up arise and let us attack by night uh, and destroy her palaces so uh, what had originally been um, the, the refuge that the people of God had sought would be the source of their demise and it would be, uh, well, nobody really goes out of their way to, uh, uh, to destroy their lives. What you invite into your life in the first instance you invite in because you think it's uh, benign or because you think it's useful to you or because you think it will protect you. And this is what the people of Judah had done in their relationship with these other nations. But God was demonstrating to them that these other nations uh, did not have their best interests at heart. But rather they had their best interests and that would be measured out. And so uh, in terms of this uh, saying process of revealing what was in, uh, the people were seeking their security, not in what would secure, but they were seeking their security in only what would consume them. There's nothing there. In verse 6, we see some more words. Thus says the Lord of hosts, cut down her trees, cast up a siege mound against Jerusalem. This is the city that must be punished. There is nothing but oppression within her. As a well keeps its water fresh, so she keeps fresh her evil. Violence and destruction are heard within her. Sickness and wounds are ever before me. Be warned, O Jerusalem, lest I turn from you in disgust, lest I make you a desolation and uninhabited land. What was going to befall Jerusalem was no accident. Because, uh, well, uh, even in this uh, place where they were surrounded, somewhat like us, I suppose, by trees in, in a way that was meant to provide a natural barrier against attack. Uh, this natural barrier would be cut down and would become the, the very uh, fuel that would serve the, the machine of war that was going to try and strike against the city. Again, uh, everything that should have provided them with security uh, was being arrayed against them. And uh, uh, so uh, the idea is that the city uh, must be punished. It deserves exactly what's going to happen to it. Uh, uh, you see, it's not that there was evil around it and innocence within. Uh, so when we uh, look at the news and we see the, uh, the shocking news of, uh, uh, of uh, a young woman who's been attacked and, uh, uh, and murdered in Melbourne, um, our hearts go to her and to those who loved her uh, and uh, they uh, uh, revile with disgust away from those who could have perpetrated such a, an evil act. Uh, but here, uh, God is saying, well, Basically, the corruption is not attacking Jerusalem from outside. The corruption is within. As a well keeps its water fresh, so she keeps fresh her evil. The, the walls that were around the city were not a defense against evil to keep what was inside pure, but rather they were holding in a, a sense of rebellion against God. The devil didn't make them do it. But rather, it was their own rebellious hearts that found uh, expression in seeking after those other nations and finding security in them. Uh, as the, the Isaiah, um, you know, puts the heat on and, and sees what's revealed within, 
uh, there is no loyalty of heart in them. And so even in this, God reaches out to the people and God uh, uh, provides them with, with, uh, in a, with words that show that what he's actually providing here, though they sound like a judgment and though they sound like scorn, uh, are really a warning. And as these words are given in anticipation of them coming to pass, it's not God saying, well, this is what's going to happen to you. No matter what you do, I'm going to carry out this upon you. But this is God saying, this is what's going to happen to you because no matter what I say and how I reach out to you, your hearts are hard against me. Be warned, O Jerusalem, he says in verse 8, lest I turn from you in disgust, lest I make you a desolation and uninhabited land. The warnings are always there. It's the heart that won't listen. And so uh, we see another area unfold before us. Uh, in verse 9, thus says the Lord of hosts, uh, they shall glean thoroughly as a vine the remnant of Israel, like a grape gatherer pass your hand again over its branches. Uh, to whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their ears are uncircumcised, they cannot listen. Behold, the word of the Lord is to them an object of scorn, they take no pleasure in it. Therefore I am full of the wrath of the Lord. I am weary of holding it in. Pour it out upon the children in the street and upon the gatherings of young men also. Both husband and wife shall be taken, the elderly and the very aged. Their houses shall be turned over to others, their fields and wives together. Uh, for I will stretch out my hand against the inhabitants of the land, declares the Lord. From the least to the greatest of them, everyone is greedy for unjust gain. From, and from prophet to priest, everyone deals falsely. They have healed the wound of my people lightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they committed abomination? No, they were not at all ashamed. They did not know how to blush. Therefore they shall fall among those who fall. At the time that I punish them, they shall be overthrown, says the Lord. Uh, the picture here of, of a gleaning that takes place after the harvest is uh, um, in some ways a, a almost a fruitless activity. The, uh, the harvest takes place and the grapes are picked. Uh, after that, uh, people come through and determine whether all the grapes are gone. Uh, and what we have here is a picture of people who come in after the people have already cleaned out everything that's left and, and finding that there's nothing nothing there. Uh, in that uh, we see that um, uh, we'd spoken last week or the week before about the idea of a remnant of a smaller group that is left behind uh, from the larger group and, and in that the kingdom of Judah if you remember what we've been talking about has already been divided off from Israel. Uh, the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom of Judah is just a couple of the tribes. Uh, it's already a remnant in itself. But after what happens to them uh, as a result of their rebellion, uh, they will be a, a remnant of a remnant, as it were, that, that will be all that's left. And uh, so God says, uh, who is left to listen? What, what will this remnant of a remnant be? To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Uh, because even there, with this tiny fragment of people left, and we've uh, uh, seen that spoken about in terms of this idea of, uh, firstly, uh, Abraham, who uh, speaks about the, this, uh, uh, the people in Sodom and, uh, uh, and how many righteous people there are. And we've already seen in Jeremiah about this idea of, is, is there anybody good left? Uh, who will be speaking to? Who is this, is this remnant that God would um, reach out to if, if a remnant was even there? Uh, because um, uh, we see that their, their privilege, their place of um, uh, being in, in that place of blessing and that place of promise seems to have blocked their ears. Their ears are uncircumcised, uh, which means to say that they're, they're not listening to God with covenant ears. They're not listening to God uh, as people who want to listen to the promises as um, words that they need to respond to. Uh, they simply want to hear the promises of God uh, as a, a means to getting what they want and a, as a means to achieving their own outcome. 
Why do we gather as God's people and why do we want to uh, listen to the word of God? Uh, Is it simply to get the outcomes that we want uh, in terms of uh, our life and our career, uh, the relationships that we're in? We think if we uh, draw near to God, then we'll get our own way. Whereas when we draw near to God, uh, what we're hearing is that uh, uh, the best way for us is God's way. And that is how you know that you're listening with covenant ears uh, when you hear the word of God and you realise that there is a response uh, that involves a a letting go on your own part and a taking up what it is God calls you to. The word of the Lord is to them an object of scorn. They take no pleasure in it. And so we we see that God is compassionate though, where his servants would, uh, would fail, uh, like Jonah. Uh, Jonah was sent to give a warning to the people of Nineveh, but he didn't want to go because he didn't want the people of Nineveh to get the warning because he knew that if, uh, uh, if they heard that uh, God in his grace would, would redeem them. But God uh, continues to uh, speak his words of warning to them and he continues to speak his words of, of grace. And it is a warning that is applicable to everybody. That there's nobody who needs to sit in a gathering of God's people and be simply, uh, if all you ever do is hear the word of God spoken in in services such as this one, uh, and your every week, every minute response is simply going through a mental file of other people who you think would benefit from having heard this, then, then you're not hearing it right. You're not hearing God's word with covenant ears uh, if your best response and your signal response week by week and day by day is, well, I'm glad that these people are here to hear this or I wish that so-and-so had been here to hear this this week, but rather to understand that God's word is speaking directly to you. And what is God calling you to hear? And how is God calling you to respond to his word? Uh, Because there will be this outpouring of judgment uh, that will fall upon every segment of society because each of them were in their own way manifesting rebelliousness against God. And it is a a comprehensive judgment uh, that doesn't simply strike at one portion of the lives of the people, uh, but their uh, their security and their relationship and their possessions and indeed uh, everything that they had presumed would be theirs out of their having God's promises or out of the the other security that they'd sought with these outside forces would be taken away. Uh, The questions that the text raise uh, for God's people uh, in that time was a warning not to presume on God uh, and not to presume on themselves and their own skill in, in gaining and securing for themselves only that which God can give. Uh, For the people who are already in captivity looking back on this, uh, again we uh, remind ourselves week by week that um, in all of this they're being reminded that the fault for their captivity is their ancestors and not God, but also the God uh, who is sovereign in terms of them being in captivity is the one who is merciful and gracious and will reach out to them and bring them back because there's no one in the people of God who is trustworthy Uh, from the least to the greatest of them everyone is greedy for unjust grain and from prophet uh, to priest everyone deals falsely there was this uh, sense of dishonesty Uh, and so uh, every area of the people were being unfaithful and uh, uh, they have healed the wound of my people lightly saying peace peace when there is no peace Uh, when uh, a little child falls down uh, the first thing you want to do is say to them you know they're there it's okay and then you want to check them for broken bones uh, to find out whether they really are okay uh, and, but here, uh, the priests were simply saying they're there to these people whose lives were uh, a rebellious ruin, and they weren't checking. 
They were simply saying they're there, it's okay, because they were living the same way themselves. Uh, friends, uh, if you uh, want to sit under the ministry of God's word, uh, it's absolutely imperative to make sure that the people who are teaching God's word uh, show that they're, being, uh, that they're receiving God's word with authority in their lives as well. Uh, you need to measure that. Uh, it's pointless to say that you're uh, in a Bible-believing church if those who lead the congregation and those who teach the congregation God's word uh, clearly don't measure up to what the Bible uh, is laying out as being the, the pattern for trusting Jesus as our Saviour and Lord and then walking after Jesus as the one who calls us to follow him. The people were shameless you see, um, God basically says that in, in terms of their rebellion, uh, they carried on this way as if there was nothing wrong at all. They did not know how to blush. Uh, when the uh, assayer comes and tests for, the, uh, uh, for what's precious and what's rubbish, uh, basically he, he can't find anything precious. There's, there is nothing of value remaining. There's really only everything that needs to be consumed. Uh, therefore they shall fall among those who fall. At that time I will punish them and they shall be overthrown, says the Lord. Now God goes on in, in verse 16. Uh, the, Stand by the roads and look and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it and find rest for your souls. But they say we will not walk in it. Now uh, I just want to stop here. Uh, in some church traditions the idea of uh, stand by the roads and ask for the ancient paths is, uh, is you know, um, another byword for saying uh, well the, yeah basically if we can just wind the clock back on our church by about 20 or 30 years um, then everything will be better. Uh, friends if we wind our denominations clock back by about 40 years we're in the group of liberal theology that won't work at all. Um, um, basically um, our denomination as a whole as a national movement has actually moved more toward the scriptures over 40 years than where it was in, in 1977. Uh, and uh, our, um, by and largely, the, the congregations that uh, uh, have allowed themselves to become mired in traditionalism have uh, uh, basically a form, but they have uh, uh, no substance. And uh, where uh, the, the truth of the gospel and the truth of the scriptures is often absent, uh, you will find, uh, well, ritualism and fancy dress taking their place uh, because if you can't give the people truth you'll give them a good show but what the Bible says here is that what we're supposed to be looking for is what God says and we're supposed to our hearts are supposed to gravitate toward that but here when the people were shown what God says and again, uh, this is to point out that they, they were not ignorant. They were fools. Remember, we've spoken about this over time, uh, that in the Bible, foolishness is not ignorance. Foolishness is not, uh, is not the absence of knowledge. Foolishness is having knowledge and refusing to act on it. Foolishness is knowing what you should do and then continuing to do the wrong thing. That's what the people do. And so uh, we're able to see this uh, uh, idea. I, I set watchmen over you saying, pay attention to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, we will not pay attention. Therefore, hear, O nations, and know, O congregation, what will happen to them. Hear, O earth, behold, I am bringing disaster upon this people, the fruit of their devices, because they have not paid attention to my words. And as for my law, they have rejected it. And so there's this announcement that's given uh, of um, uh, the sound of the trumpet. Uh, and uh, uh, again, uh, the people who are in captivity can say, well, God is as clear with our forefathers as clear could be. How could they miss it? 
in the same way that um, um, I'm sure many of you uh, who grew up in churches and uh, uh, who uh, know that you were sitting under ministries where the gospel was being proclaimed uh, uh, for a variety of reasons couldn't hear it and you didn't know what was being preached. You, you thought that the essence of being a Christian was being a good person or that uh, the whole idea of what God wanted you to do was try harder. And then one day you suddenly came to the understanding that what people had been saying all along was that it's not your best efforts that are the ground that gets you into heaven, uh, but it's the faithful obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ on your behalf. It's his death in your place on the cross that accepts the punishment that you deserve for sin. And you go, well, um, where did this come from? But then you think about it and say, well, that's what people have been saying all along. I just couldn't hear it. You look back through the hymn book and you see that every hymn you ever sung uh, had those w thoughts woven through it. And you just thought that they were pleasant songs about sheep and pastures and, um, you know, all that sort of thing. They said, we will not pay attention. There was a, a, a blockage in their hearts that stopped them at the point of paying attention to what they should have been paying attention to. They wouldn't listen. And so God speaks and says, this is what will happen to you. And in this, it sounds like judgment and it is judgment, but it's still meant to be warning. That there will be a disaster on the people and the fruit of their devices because they have not paid attention to my words. Uh, this is not God going out of his way to create punishments for people. This is God simply saying that if this is what your heart desires with all your heart, you will have it and it will be what consumes you. And they've rejected the very means by which they could um, fall under conviction and turn back to God. In this, uh, we see, uh, he says, What use to me is frankincense that comes from Sheba or sweet cane from a distant land. Your burnt offerings are not acceptable. Uh, friends, these people were in church every Sunday. It wasn't Sunday and it wasn't church, but they were there. But then they were still experiencing the judgment of God. It's not where your body is on Sunday. It's not how much money you put in the giving box. It's not how many rosters you sign up to. Uh, God is saying, where is your heart? Does your heart belong to me? And if your heart does not belong to me, uh, then it doesn't matter what you wear or where you sit. Don't mistake the fruit of obedience for the ground of acceptance. Hearts that follow Jesus do certain things, but we do certain things because they're a response, not because they're what gain us. And so uh, we see this final section, thus says the Lord. Um, again, a people is coming from the north country, a great nation is stirring from the farthest parts of the earth. They lay hold on bow and javelin, they are cruel and have no mercy. The sound of them is like a roaring sea. They ride on horses, set in array as a man for battle against you, O daughter of Zion. We have heard the report of it. Our hand fall helpless. Anguish has overtaken us. Pain as a pain of a woman in labour. Go not out into the field nor walk on a road. For the enemy has a sword. Terror is on every side. O daughter of my people, put on sackcloth and roll in ashes. Make mourning as for an only son. Most bitter lamentation for suddenly the destroyer will come upon us. And so, again, uh, in terms of what God says, well, we're told uh, uh, that there's going to be this invasion. It will come down from the north uh, towards this nation in the south. Uh, and uh, this great nation is stirring. Uh, and uh, they are a merciless adversary. Uh, and that's the, the point of them is that, uh, uh, by and largely, they're worse than anything that the people could have feared. And they will come against uh, Jerusalem. And uh, uh, the idea being that uh, uh, the, um, the, 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 the severity with which the, um, 
uh, with which this invading army falls uh, is also likened and, and um, uh, similarly to the idea of, of how the people of Jerusalem will respond and they're going to respond uh, with an anguish that is uh, uh, in, in the severity of what grips a woman when she's in childbirth. It, it will be a, 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 well, a considerable pain and anguish from which there is no relief. The enemy has a sword and terror is on every side. It is all encompassing. There's no escape. There's no relief. Uh, there is only repentance. And again, here's this call to, uh, uh, to sorrow, to turn away, uh, make mourning as for an only son. Uh, and suddenly the, um, the destroyer will come upon us. It's his call uh, to repentance, but the people won't repent. And in all of this, we've been able to see that, uh, um, that Jeremiah is called to be this impartial observer as, a, as an assayer, one who carries out this testing of metals. He's really supposed to report just the facts. And in, in this, he has been able to uh, witness uh, from all of this, of course, that uh, it's not a matter of saying, well, there's this and there's some impurities, uh, but rather it's saying that it's all impurity and no substance. That's what's there. Uh, and uh, so the, I have made you a tester of metals among my people that you may know and test their ways. They're all stubbornly rebellious, going about with slanders. They're bronze and iron. All of them act corruptly. The bellows blow fiercely. The lead is consumed by the fire. In vain the refining goes on, for the wicked are not removed. Rejected silver they are called, for the Lord has rejected them. Uh, and in this, um, the, the testing of their life... Uh, simply reveals that there's nothing there. There's nothing there. Uh, friends, uh, in that, uh, there's such a warning for the people who listen to this later uh, and to say, well, uh, that was our forefathers. God is merciful, but what are we? And in that, uh, we um, are instructed and challenged by these scriptures as well. Uh, for the same merciful God... The same God who keeps reaching out is the one who reaches through these scriptures to us. Uh, and yet the people of old rejected silver their call for the Lord has rejected them. And he doesn't reject them uh, out of spite on his own. He simply rejects them because there's, there's nothing acceptable. There's nothing of faith. There's only dross. And it's consumed itself. Uh, in that, uh, we're able to, uh, to think about what it is uh, and that the refining process goes on. The refining process is spoken about in New Covenant terms in 1 Peter. Uh, it speaks about the 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 7, the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it's tested by fire, may be found to the result in praise and glory and honour at the revelation of Jesus Christ. What is it that is uh, at your heart? What is it that is at our heart as a church? Uh, I speak to you about other churches and other churches, uh, uh, you know, primarily their desire as they express it is to make budget or their, um, you know, uh, desire as a church is not to close. Their desire as a church is that uh, uh, they could have things like they were 30 or 40 years ago. Uh, our desire as a church is that people will know the Lord Jesus Christ and know him as Saviour and Lord and that we will live as people who know Jesus as Saviour and Lord, that we might be uh, a witness of that with integrity. That is our goal. That is our common aim to encourage each other with. Uh, and friends, uh, there are varieties of circumstances around us that will say, well, look, we could find our security in having a nice building. We could find our security in having a, a settled bank balance. We could find our security in having a certain number of people who come along each week. But our only security as a church is in our capacity to help other people know Jesus. That is the, um, the, the heartbeat of who we are as a church and that is what we hope people who come into contact with us go away knowing that we're a people who know and love Jesus and are known by and who are loved by Jesus. 
Though you have not seen him, you love him. When everything else is stripped away, that is all we want to remain in this place. Though you do not see him, you believe in him and rejoice with him with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. When everything else is stripped away, what remains here but a love for Jesus? And that is what fills us with joy and satisfaction. That is uh, the, the, what brings happiness to our hearts as a people when we see and know that we're growing in our love for Jesus and that others are uh, coming to him and growing in their love too. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for your word to us tonight. We pray that you would uh, help us and encourage us uh, as we take our joy in you uh, and, Father, uh, as we um, rest in the delight uh, that you have in your people uh, as we rest in Jesus. Father, uh, uh, be with us as we uh, take these truths out uh, into our community uh, this week. And we pray this uh, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen.